Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back with uh, another video in the Cathars Amiga 4000 repair series. So, if you watched the first, I think there were roughly four or five parts where this board featured, there were a couple of updates in the last one or two of those videos there, where it was combined with terrible fire stuff, I think. But if you watched that series, you'll note that when it got back to Cathars, one of the ports was smashed off, so I'll have a look underneath that in a minute. But uh, Chris, uh, you know, Cathars, did a good job of fitting a replacement port there and fixing with a couple of wires. It just needs a little bit of a reflow because I noticed that the solder points they look like they've been done with uh, uh, lead free solder you know, they got really dull, it's not very shiny so I think we might just remove the solder there and just add a bit of fresh solder, maybe change the gauge of the wires he did express concern himself about the thickness of the wire he used but he's done a good job, is the point um, yes, yeah, so this bud was repaired and recats it was, one of the f it was, I think, the first 4000 looked at, you know, so maybe I didn't get things quite right, and I think, well, the fact we're looking at it here in the follow on video shows that I missed some stuff. There's still just a wee bit more, you know, it's a bit dirty around here still, a wee bit dirty around a few things. Um, some of that is going to be environmental stuff, you know, it's obviously been, uh, I don't know, three or more years, I think, this has been sat around, maybe two years, I've lost track of time. So over that period of time, it's uh, been working fine, but I think an audio fault developed. And that could just be a via needs plug-in somewhere back here. And that's the, the thing, it's, it's sometimes useful, I mean I feel embarrassed about this, I've, to the point where I've said I'll cover the cost of shipment, you know, send it back. And I don't expect any money to, or anything for, to repair this, any parts and things, I'll absorb them. It's, uh, it's making a video, so. And it's going to be simple stuff, it's just the audio. It's going to be sold, flux, time required really and then just shipping which I'll cover. So I've connected it all up we're using the um, 030 so I've set the jumpers to internal internal two jumpers there so you want the you know the CPU clock and the 90 degree phase shifted clock to come from the motherboard or whether you want the car to provide its own clocks. Uh, and we set them to left, internal, internal. That's a stock machine, which will work with the uh, A2630 here. This is the one we fixed in a previous video, so it's there fixed 2022 from Stefan. Thanks ever so much to Stefan for letting me keep that, because it helps with things like this. I can just plug it in really easily. Kaffer sent me a letter with this actually, it's included the 3000 as well. He's talking about the audio issue there on the uh, 4000. I, I, can't, I don't want to read that all out on this video because uh, I'll be here forever, but yeah, you can have a read of it. And he's included some amazing things which you'll see more of later in the video. And as you can see, looking at the screen there, he's got 3.1.4 kickstart ROMs fitted at the moment. So obviously, this board is working, it's just the sound issue. So I'm going to go connect an IDE drive. We'll boot this up and get some sound playing on it, see what it sounds like. So wrist strap on, uh, we need to remove this IDE Terminator. Uh, if you're not familiar, I covered this on one of the live streams I did actually. I'll perhaps try and find it, stick a link uh, down below. Yeah, it's it just has a resistor, two resistors, between a couple of data bits to ground I think, pulls them low. Which means that when it uh, queries the IDE, because those two signals are low, it goes, ah, you got no drive connected. Or something like, sort of like that. There might even be more than two, but I think, yeah, there's two. I think there's a resistor row with four resistors on it, but only two of them are used, or something like that. Um, yeah, so we can get this on, being very careful to make sure it's correctly aligned, because if you misalign something like this, you'll kill the ID interface. Hang on, let's just make sure I am getting this aligned properly. So if we reach one of these longest ones, cross, make sure it's on firmly. Just reseat the card for good measure. This card may not boot because, well, workbench installs, you've got drivers and things on there, for depending on what um, cards and hardware and things you've got on the board. So in terms of the IDE, it's using Gary IDE, isn't it? Super Gary or whatever it is. So it may not boot from that. We'll just give it a try. Let's just see if the LED flickers at all. Yeah, that's not booting. With a different compact flash card, you can see that flash in there. So this is the one from my 4000 now. It's got MMU lib and all that installed, 060 lib. So is it going to boot? I don't know. In fact, it's come up with an error already. Oh, and it's this whole chestnut that you get when you've got a different version of Kickstarter. These 3.1.4s, they don't have an icon library. So oh, that is so blooming annoying. I think, you know, what I might do is just connect a floppy drive up and just boot test kit or something directly from a floppy drive and we'll just test the audio that way and I'll deal with the hard disk booting thing later. And of course the solution may be just to get some Kickstart 3 or 3.1 ROMs in here because if I did that then it would boot up okay. Yeah, so I'll test the other things later but look how high the volume is, 42. 
very quiet, very distorted. We've got a main supply rail just not getting somewhere there. Maybe the 12 volts is not getting where it needs to get to. Um, mind you, you got plus 12, minus 12, but in any case, there's literally no volume at all. So I'm going to start by just uh, measuring around the voltages, actually switch it off. We don't need it playing audio while we're doing this. I'm just going to just position things a little bit better here. I need to get this cable sort of, I don't know, rooted some, somewhere where there we go, it's not going to interfere too much that I can actually access this area here. I'm going to wedge the ground in one of the ground connections down here if I can. There we go. So we've got our ground wedged in on the power supply thing. Uh, let's just measure uh, down here. Let's measure that. Zero volts. Now one of these has got to be the other way around, isn't it? Zero volts. This one here. There's our bias, hang on. I can stay on to it. 2.3 volts, so we've got that. There's something missing from here. And there's something missing from there, I think. So, I guess the next thing to do is, and I need to remind myself, look at the pin out of this op amp here. And we check the plus and minus uh, 12 volts. Let's just test these resistors back here. So I've been very careful to just get onto the single point there, minus 12, uh, and then the single point up here, I think, minus 12, and the point down here, minus 12. Yeah, this cap here I'm not so sure about, because maybe it's a coupling cap, that might be normal. These two here, I think, are coupling caps, uh, this one at the back. And if memory serves, it's the corner points, isn't it? Uh, is the inputs and outputs. And I think the centre pins are the voltages. So it looks like we've got like zero volts on one side of that op amp. Minus 12 on the other. I think we're missing the plus 12, actually. I think all that's happening here is the op amp is not getting plus 12. So I've just looked at the schematics and I'm looking at the positive and negative rails because I kind of showed the middle pin on this chip here, one's negative, I think one's positive, yeah, on the centre pin of the op amp there. And we're missing the positive 12 volt rail. So if I just test from um, these two caps here, these are the two, 47 microfarads, test from the centre pin on the left side here to this cap we've got a short circuit there so we know that that's providing one of the rails yeah for the the pin on the left center left the other one up here you know we can test the other points um, oh we have a join there as well strangely enough and that might be the answer we look like we've got a short somewhere there uh, the one on this side here yeah it connects to the middle not up there Anyway, so the right hand side is connected to the top cap, the left hand side is connected to the bottom cap, but I think we've got a kind of a short there, might be a shorted cap or something like that. Um, and if I power this on, yeah, and the ground is on one of the ground tabs on the board there. And if we measure on volts DC, if we measure this first cap here, so it's left hand side I think is ground, hang on, let's put it on volts DC. It does help if you measure voltage. Yeah, so the left hand side, which I think is ground, yes, nothing there. Zero volts ground, pretty much. Right hand side, uh, zero. So we've got a missing voltage. That's going to be the positive, isn't it? I think. Uh, unless I'm a mistake, I think that one's the left side. Actually. Anyway, there's no voltage there on that cap. Uh, the cap above it, if we measure the, hang on, center point carefully here, you can see there we've got minus 12 volts. And the other side of it, we've got ground zero so it's this bottom cap here is missing its supply rail which I think is a positive I think we're lacking the positive because we saw a negative voltage on the uh, top cap we saw no voltage on this bottom one so all I need to do now is look back at the schematics and try and work out why that cap has not got plus 12 volts yeah and looking at the schematics here you can see we've got a couple of resistors here one ohm jobs look 
Chances are one of those has gone out of circuit. I think that's going to be it, isn't it? Now, is this going to be a repeat of the original fault, i.e. the same resistor that may have failed there before? Or, because I think I might have fitted a smaller one. Is it a case of the current capabilities were not enough for that resistor? That's the possibility. Or is there a fault somewhere that's drawing a bit more current? Um, anyway, on the positive side, it's, it's that one there, R403, I think it is. So I'm just going to flip the board, try and find that resistor, and see if that resistor is the issue. It could be the resistor's all right, but the wire it leads to and from, you know, to in order to connect the plus 12 up to this this rail where this cap has not got positive voltage on it here, that might be the issue. Uh, it's a really interesting one, this. <laughs> it's bizarre. So if you measure on volts DC from ground up there, so the resistor we replaced in the previous video, R402, is it? Oh. 403, nothing on one side, 12 volts on the other. Now, bear in mind this is in series with the 12 volt rail. So it's got 12 volts going into it, nothing on the pad. Yeah, this is the issue. But if we switch it off, so you, I hear what you're saying, you're saying, Chris, that resistor's burned open circuit, hasn't it? So if we measure across it, it measures, uh, hang on, oh, it's showing 50 ohms. It shouldn't be, it should be 1 ohm. And if we measure on continuity, it measures as a short. So I think what's happened here is it's turned into a 50 ohm resistor. That's really weird, isn't it? Yeah, 50 ohms. How bizarre. Hmm. So first thing I'm going to do is swap that resistor out. We need to work out what's drawing too much current though, because there must be something around here drawing more current. I think what I may do is just order him a new op amp and swap the op amp out. Right, it's a bit like that CD32 FMV video. I've just checked the two caps. Let me just show you on the schematics. Um, there's on the rail we're dealing with here, the plus 12. That resistor obviously is 50 ohms now. So I thought I'll check this cap here. It's uh, 0.22, that's 220 nanofarads, just like on the uh, CD32 FMV module. And then there's a, a 0.1 here, 100 nanofarad. That one there, hang on. Uh, is that this one? Yes, it is. Hang on. Or is it? No, it's not. But in any case, I was measuring across this cap here, this beefy one, showing like 10 ohms or something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit a 1 ohm resistor there now. Yeah, move the old one, fit that. Remove this and replace that with another 220 nanofarad cap and replace that C402A, wherever that is, points one microfarad, 100 nanofarad, and hopefully that should solve it. So I'll start with the resistor. I'm not going to test it until I've swapped out the two uh, caps as well. Now 220 nanofarad have got some uh, slightly smaller footprint size ones, but they're exactly the right type, you know, value and stuff of component, just a smaller, smaller uh, footprint. So let me just see which one it is. Yeah, so it's this second one down here. I could use hot air. But uh, yeah, I'm choosing not to do that at this stage, just get a little bit of solder onto both sides there. I'm just going to have a little bit of a float around with it. Tweezers and hot air might be easier, but I'm just going to heat both sides there. Hang on. And get it off like that, then just tap that onto the mat there. We can reflow anything there where I've accidentally touched them with some flux and some fresh solder in a minute. Just mop up the solder on one side there. That's it. So that one pad is clean. These may be exactly the same ones I fitted originally, I don't know. I know there's nothing wrong with them. I suspect it's like I say it's one of the caps that's caused this issue. So I just need to get that into position. I'll try and get it the same way as the others in terms of its print this time, because last time I think it's uh, it was upside down kind of thing. Uh, and this is where I may need magnification. Just try and get it onto the first solder pad. Heat the solder on that pad. It'll pull itself into position like that. Just inspect to see how straight it is. It's pretty darn straight, actually straighter than it was originally. And get a wee bit of solder onto that pad there. Yeah, there's, there's no easy way for me to try and get the iron at the right angle without blocking the camera here. Yeah, we got a bit of solder on that side. Let's just reflow that side with a wee bit more. So, yeah, so I will add some flux and reflow that with a better shape tip later. But right now, 
That's not looking too bad actually. So the next thing I'm going to do, and I'll show you this, I'll uh, record it on the PC. I'm going to consult Amiga PCB Explorer, work out where those uh, two caps are on the uh, diagram we talked about earlier, the one up there and the one there, and uh, swap those out. So just clicking on the 12 volt pin on that chip. That then leads to the 220 nanofarad cap there. Flipping the board over, we can see it's highlighted one of the paths to the right there, there's a resistor, but there's also a 100 nanofarad cap. I don't actually need to swap out that 100 nanofarad cap, it is as good as new. Right, and no surprise, the cap I measured here, remember I said it was five ohms, and it looks like the 220 nanofarads that are on the CD32 FMV, it's the same one, it's the same type of cap, and it looks a bit dodgy, and it measures five ohms, so it's that cap, that's what's caused this, yeah, that's what's caused that resistor to fail, a bit too much current through a one ohm resistor, as I've said so many times, it kind of acts like a fuse so uh, yeah anyway the one ohm has been replaced we'll get that off next replace that and then the 100 microfarad which i'm going to swap anyway and i know that isn't going to be the issue it's one of the ones up here somewhere i've just took a screenshot you know a photo of that and we'll swap that out anyway just to rule it out so there's nothing else on that the transition from the fact the 12 volts coming into this area here to going to the op amp it's going to be this it's definitely going to be that let's measure it when we get it off let's, uh, let's do that now together um, it's going to get blocked a little bit by the uh, iron but if we just get a load of solder onto that I'll try and come in from this angle without melting that cap if I can and uh, I'm going to get my prodding tool just because if I do it this way you see I might unblock it and let's try and go a bit more sharper angle here just go heat, 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 slide And if we measure that now, I'm darn sure that's going to be a blooming resistor. Can grab, grab it on. Put it on top of Paula. Multimeter on continuity test. Let's just see if the 5 ohms here is gone. There might be a short across there now, actually. No, there isn't. It's high resistance now, that. Yeah. Our capacitor. Oh, it's all right now. This is sometimes the issue with these, though. Sometimes you can measure them. Oh, yeah, 5 ohms, I'll show you. It's not beeping, but it is showing. 5 ohms and the capacitor measures 5 ohms there you go that's our 5 ohms <laughs> problem solved so yeah one of the quickest shortest videos in the world on this one I will just extend this a little bit by cleaning up and showing the end result stuff we'll do a bit of testing on it and see if there's anything else that needs doing while we're here anyway exactly the same thing we did before and it's important to know like I said I'm sure I measured around this before I sent it back to Calfers last time and there were no mysterious shorts and things around there. That would a level like that there would translate into a voltage drop. So you'd have sound problems straight away. And there wasn't one. So we're back to the CD32 FMV video summary at the end. Those 220 nanofarad caps swap for blooming things. And I'm gonna go looking around the board to see if there's any others that need swapping. Right, so here we are, booted back up with that capacitor. Replaced. There's no short on that rail. Haven't measured it, but there's no reason why it shouldn't work unless the chip is faulty. Hey, sorted. That's all it was. Much, much, much louder now. Let's just turn these channels off and on. Now let's change the that to a sine wave. So I'll put them all on and switch the, sign, uh, the filter off, hang on, or on, hang on, so I've got all the channels on, and I'll switch the filter on, you can't really tell at that frequency, change it to 10 kilohertz, I'm not sure I can hear that, yes I can. It's really testing my hearing that. You might be able to hear that better on the camcorder capture there than I can. But filter on and off, I can hear the difference here now. Kind of got to position myself in exactly the right place or I can't hear it. Anyway, I'm very pleased. There we go. I'll let uh, Chris know. Uh, how do we change that music? There we go. Sweet. Nice simple one that, wasn't it? So yeah, I've just switched the filter off. It sounded a bit strange with the filter on there. Uh, yeah, so that resistor had gone open circuit because that turned into a five ohm short and it's shortened from plus 12 to ground. Yeah, 
um, which draws excess current on the 12 volt rail yeah turning that into a larger resistor so it hadn't completely blown open that but the voltage level just gone right down yeah very interesting so I'm trying to keep this video nice and short, I'll show you a before and after. So you can see I've started to tin up some of these connections here. If you look further up, let's move the camera. Yeah, if you look at some of these wires up here, they are uh, very dirty. Yeah, like showing signs of corrosion. And there are a few points like around here, one or two around here, some traces, copper traces. And there's the odd wire and stuff around here. So I've been just uh, using the fiberglass pen on some of these, I'm going to tin them up and then plug anything that needs plugging but it's just a bit of preventative work really you know i'll clean it along here again it looks a bit dirty toothbrush this whole area but you know what it's not done too bad it's been you know two or three years or so and it's just covered in mostly dust but you know anything that's copper's just gone a bit dull there's no actual signs of corrosion anywhere uh, and the faults that's reoccurred here is not corrosion related really it's just that 220 nanofarad cap. You could argue maybe I missed that first time around, but you know what? I did scope the uh, 12 volt rails and things here, and the op amp, and there were no issues with lead logic levels, and that was showing 5 ohms, and I just think it's deteriorated, just like the ones do on the CD32 FMV unit. So I've ordered some more 220 nanofarad caps, the right size, 1206s, I think they are, and I'm going to uh, replace a number more on this board as part of a preventative thing within this video so you know there's a few around like you can see one there for example I'm betting that's a 220 nanofarad it's these double width ones they're not 1206 it's like 1208s or something I think and I'll bet that's 220 nanofarad and I think that's why the one underneath the ROM on mine just blew up at some point it was in the terrible fire series there I think it was towards the back end it was one of the final things I had to do to the board I think I kept or it might have been the one that went to Stephen I can't remember which way around it was but nevertheless one of those 220 nanofarads under the kickstart ROMs just blew itself open for no reason it hadn't been stressed it hadn't been cracked it just decided to short circuit so it's interesting isn't it whatever manufacturer Commodore used for these they seem dodgy they seem totally unreliable Yeah, so testing at various stages, so you can see it is a bit dirty. I'll hover around, we'll try and focus something like here. Yeah, some of the wires around that uh, gal there. Um, dirt between the legs on that chip there, jumper's looking a bit dirty. So yeah, over a period of time, it's a bit dirty, and look at these wires here. Yeah, so some of these, I'll tin these wires up, uh, clean around these chips, reflow where I need to. And then up here, if I can get there, yeah, these jumpers, you can see how bad these are. And then over the cable, you can see a star to tin up here. You can see how much better that's looking, but there's still some coppery traces. And we need to go further up here as well. Ignore the sound, sounded a bit strange where it cuts out, skips a note. It's just because it's uh, playing from floppy. Uh, yeah, so lots of work down there needed. Uh, and up here again. And even further afield round, round Buster, can you see? Yeah, so I didn't reflow all these things. They were already uh, like this before it came to me in the first series there. But I didn't clean around it as thoroughly as I could have done. So, yeah, we'll try and get this looking super clean before it goes back. Yeah, yeah, and here, even here, even here, look at the vines here, a bit dark. So I'm going to tin some of these up and scrub this area again. So you can see I've had a really good scrub around here with the uh, fiberglass pen and she's using some vinegar now cleaned a number of times with IPA look how cold and shiny those do yeah it uh, just helps as like um, you know something you should do before you start to solder on these because you just etch the surface just a tiny 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 bit it's nowhere near acidic enough uh, when it's uh, white straight off like that to cause any damage but it should mean that when we get some flux on there and start to drag the solder blade around it will clean up the surface and the solder will transfer from the uh, you know the tip through the braid and onto the pads and uh, traces and things there so I'll clean with a bit of IPA now so I need to go further afield here There's some more stuff up here more stuff down the here still but yeah hopefully you get the idea this is just something I should have done when I originally did this for Cathars. But you know what, it was the first 4000 I worked on. And if you watch that video, you'll know that I was like, of the opinion, I'm not touching anything on here. But 
isn't directly related to what I'm specifically fixing and what was the purpose of it coming to me well it was a recap and an audio issue so you know had I done some of these things um, well I should have done these things is the whole point but you know it took so much time these things are so time consuming which as I said in that video is often why they get written off someone just goes oh I'll just take the chips off it and put it onto a new Amiga or sell it for spares Anyway, it's looking pretty gold down here, so I'll get some flux on there and I'll start to tin up. Right, still working after tinning up the traces around here. Yeah, I will continue to work this way actually to, when I'm doing lots of work on traces and turning things up. Test at various points, just make sure it's still working. And then if I do get a problem, I know it's localised to where I was working. So it's a lot better around this area, but more work needs doing. Now these jumpers, they're kind of melted on the bottom, uh, not just on the actual jumper itself, but on the housing. Yeah, so some of these jumpers, I'm going to replace the jumper and the actual jumper, <laughs> so the actual bit that goes on, and the three-pin header there, because the three-pin header is melted at the bottom, where someone's reflowed around this previously. The soldering is not that great, and there's one or two vines around there I want to sort anyway. And I can't get right up against the connections here, so I'm going to remove this, I'm going to remove the one over there and I'm going to remove this I don't think that ever came off this board when it came in originally there's a trace here that needs to turn it up you can see it's kind of a little bit exposed and on the edge just near the uh, ground point there so I was just going to tin those and I'm also going to reflow these they may have got reflowed when it came to me previously this cap down here is balked. Now, if you saw the uh, CD32 FMV module video, and we talked about that before in this video already, you know, the cap on the audio circuit over there, this is the same size, 220 nanofarad. And I was looking at it in the light really close. I went, I'm sure there's a line down the middle of that. And I inspected on my phone. I'll perhaps give you uh, a macro shot on my phone. I'll stick it up now. Yeah, so these 220 nanofarad caps suffer from the exact same issue as on the CD32. Maybe a bit of corrosion is the uh, cause there, you know, you get a little bit on there and then it starts to break down the layers and as soon as you get some sort of resistive thing going on, it, I don't know, it escalates and then turns into more and more of a resistor until it shorts. I've got no idea. But any, in any case, that does need swapping. Um, and I think there's a real-time clock issue still with us, so I'll need to remove the battery, but I'll do that later. At this stage, I just kind of want to keep working this way here, deal with vias and things around these uh, gals, reflow. You can see that looks pretty crusty. Yeah, reflow around there, reflow these two, swap that cap out, and then just have a bit of clean and scrub around here and just see, see how it's looking at that point. So, I mean, everything we're doing here at the moment is kind of, you know, largely cosmetic. Um, but it is at the same time a little bit preventative uh, you know where you've got corrosion on jumpers and things like that they've been melted yeah it's an eyesore but yeah I think swapping them out is a good idea it's only going to take I don't know an extra 15 minutes or something or 20 minutes more to swap all three of these jumpers the hardest one is the uh, you know the 10 pin one that's for the or 12 pin is it the option jumpers that Commodore never used uh, but put in place I think Assuming at some point you might have had uh, I don't know, a chipset on here that would allow 8 meg of chip RAM. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to use the, the solder pump to do this. And obviously, we need to tidy up the joystick port stuff here as well. So, perhaps do that after I've sorted all these jumpers and things out. And I've said this so many times, but when you're desoldering, obviously just put a bit of pressure on the thing from the other side. I can see it wobbling. All three pins are wobbling. So I know that that's ready to sort of start to ease off. And if it's still not coming off, maybe just consider heating it as you pull it. It's coming off, look. And we've got no through hole or anything there. So, yeah, successful removal of that jumper. And there we go, I'll show you the actual uh, jumpers up close as well in a minute, because they are all sort of affected by the alkaline. So yeah, those now need cleaning up, I'll show you that in a sec. Yeah, and that one's removed, and obviously we can now get to the vias and things that are right next to that. Um, and it just makes it a bit easier to go back over this area if there's anything else that needs doing. Uh, and obviously we've got that jumper off there. Again, the pads just need cleaning up. Can you see the dark? They're really dull. So yeah, we're not really fixing anything here, are we? We're just... 
making it look clean and tidy and uh, maybe you could argue you know helping prevent some sort of future failure it's really sticky uh, and it's cleaning with the vinegar and stuff we'll do the exact same thing on that one and I'll tin these up before I fit the new jumpers there we go looking a lot better and you'll agree and down here same thing I'm just being careful to try and avoid removing any solder mask where I can around there and the silk screen some of the silk screen you know the white print here that's the silk screen some of that will come off when you start using a fiberglass pencil on these where you've got extensive corrosion can't really be avoided but anyway you can see that is looking so much better so a wee bit of vinegar here and yeah that looks new now doesn't it <laughs> it does it looks incredible clean and tidy but I will get flux and braid and go over those you know just freshly turn them up um, they'll go much shinier than that so a wee bit of flux a wee bit of flux around these different areas here all of the little veins around here I've just exposed you know they're, they're not too bad but yeah over time with a bit of moisture in the environment you know some humidity or something and uh, yeah they could be uh, an issue so let's just deal with it so quite a lot of solder onto the tip that tip doesn't need cleaning I'll perhaps do that in a minute I'll show you that actually got a tip cleaner so uh, yeah the technique here if you've not seen it before I'm sure I showed it in this video already is to get onto the braid get the braid up to temperature and have a little slide Hang on. yeah the irons catch on something here there we go uh, it, after a while you'll get this technique down to T and you can see how much better those pads are and it's a twofold thing you're not just tinning when you do this you gain a bit of friction any little bits corrosion that remain with a forwards backwards motion you will help remove the corrosion you know the corroded uh, oxidized trace um, and as I've said in other videos it's sometimes a two or three phase thing so what I mean is you clean up now with IPA inspect you might find there's one trace that's not tinned enough I can see one on the bottom there let's let's just go over that uh, and I haven't scratched that to trace the, the um, solder mask has worn off it so just by virtue of going forwards and backwards there the solder mask is so thin there you go we've tinned one of the traces that go to the uh, pad and that's a good thing because it's not, not then going to mysteriously have a fault at some point where you're like what's going on and it's like that one trace has um, you know, I've done that one as well now that one trace has kind of gone open circuit and you, you don't know that I mean those are the sorts of faults that would be really blooming hard to find you know a trace underneath the jumper how do you know that how do you know where to look you know that sort of that sort of failure could be game over for someone like this even for someone like me because I'm like you know, let's just start trying to do logic analyzer captures and really in-depth level of testing. It can be really difficult to work out certain types of faults like that. So yeah, we're doing the virus all around there now. Around that one, uh, is it 166 or 161? I forget. So the temptation while I'm working on this area is to go much further afield. I think I'm going to get this cap off next, replace that, join this better to the via, because I don't know you can see it's just like kind of touching the edge of the via, it solders the via, it just looks a bit bodgy. I th that was when I recapped that and obviously it was uh, not making a good connection there. So yeah, I'll get a little bit more solder on it at the point where it goes to the via, swap this cap, get a bit of flux on here, reflow that, get a flux on these, reflow that, clean up, retest. So I won't reflow those just yet, I'll do this whole area at the same time here. So before I do the next lot of cleanup, just swapped over to my CPU card that I fitted an 030 with an MMU in a previous video, link will be up there, and I fitted my compact flash card and my Kickstart 3 ROMs, because with Kickstart 3.1.4 or whatever it had, it was going on about Icon Lib, and without the MMU, I couldn't boot from this compact flash card that's up for the 060 that uses MMU Lib. I'm going to test a few games out from the compact flash card, just to make sure it is working. Uh, in particular June, because when we've been playing that from floppy disk, there are some sort of 
timing issues with it where it misses a note as it transitions frames and things you know sections of the demo there and I think that's just because the floppy version that's not designed to run on an AGA system by default so a bit of a macro on the progress so far there's still a lot to do there's the old uh, bit of copper still showing the odd bit of corrosion certainly the odd way around these uh, gals here I haven't really done around those gals but we flowed lots of things here covered lots of traces that were absolutely shot and veins that were absolutely shot so you can see I'm working down here now at the moment cleaning up the battery contacts those traces there you can see it's a bit of state and you can see when I originally did this I think I fixed the ramp maybe I didn't but I didn't send those uh, veins and things there so those are all copper now gonna send those up and um, yeah and then I think I'm gonna get the real-time clock battery back on I just measured the battery because one of the things he said was the uh, real-time clock is defaulting well it's a zero volts so it's no wonder it's defaulting I don't actually think there's a real-time clock fault but yeah there is the odd via like I say and pin you can see the pins on the gal there look a bit weird they need reflowing someone else reflowed them previously and uh, same all around and there's the odd via around those that's uh, so obviously jumper replaced brand new pin header and jumper brand new pin header uh, and brand new pin header and again just one or two pins will just need the odd reflow but it's looking a thousand times better so I also need to continue doing the same thing around here there's the odd veneer that needs to tin up and stuff around here but this board is fully functional at the moment I think except for the real-time clock we need to test right so you're quite far back there it's taken me uh, about an hour maybe an hour and a half ish to clean around here read on the two wires send all around all the wires that are questionable around here the traces you know you could argue if you wanted to do a really 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 thorough job and uh, this is the thing you know I've spent insane hours on this board just like I did on the two terrible fire ones you really need to remove the sim sockets and stuff but the corrosion didn't really get that far but it could have traveled up the three traces there but uh, anyway it's been reliable in terms of the RAM access this so there's, there's no issue with the RAM and the sims are nice and clean but nevertheless the point I'm trying to make is you can you know spend not some amount of time on these if you want to do a really 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 perfect job yeah and then you come across the question of should you just buy a re Amiga 4000 board and transplant all the chips well for me I'd hate to build one of those plumbing things if I'm honest they just take so much time it's removing the chips from the old boards as well, it's like anything to avoid heating uh, you know your customs and things and they're all soldered on on these so we are back to the fact that all this is working none of this needed doing here I mean I hope Chris is alright with me doing this, I did say you're alright with me cleaning it up further and he's like yeah alright no worries but some people when they see all these silvery pads and traces might be put off but I would much rather see this level of tinning around an area like this versus what was there which is you know really dark traces where the solder mask is worn off and the copper's oxidized and greeny pads and things like that you know because ultimately they're just gonna they're gonna come back and haunt you Uh, that's not too bad right so it's booting after doing all of that work around here I got the battery back in measured uh, the pin up here 1.2 volts brand new battery uh, and I measured the battery and showing 1.5 or 1.6 volts you take it out and it measures 3 volts so I think what's happening here is uh, there may be a short somewhere on the charge circuit which means that the battery is powering the, the 5 volt rail or something else on the 5 volt rail it could be there's a 10k resistor needs removing somewhere because I vaguely remember when I looked at doing the CR2032 mod myself on mine I removed that resistor and then um, I had no issues I don't know who fitted this I don't know whether I fitted it for him I don't think I did I think it was already on there when it came to me in the previous you know three four parts etc at this point here I was just testing the diodes on diode test of the multimeter uh, I'll show you an excerpt of the schematic just after this you can see the circuits pretty basic but there are you know two or three different diodes around that area that are worth checking 
Yeah, and looking at the schematics here, it did kind of lead me to check the supply to a couple of those 1N4148s, because I think uh, one of them was missing. So the really weird voltage issue with this real-time clock has driven me nuts, seriously. I spent two hours looking at this. I've had the battery off and on, it's, it's loosely connected at the moment. I plugged a via here because we weren't getting 12 volts here, so this that was a problem. Yeah, We can check that in a minute. The left two pins on these 1N4148s here, we should have 12 volts. And then uh, it switches in such a way that this is powered by the 5 volts rail while it's on. Yeah, Now, I removed the diode from the underside of this. I'll just show you actually, just pull it off. Uh, yeah, I removed it and just bridged it. Yeah, And I've put a low forward switching diode on there. Uh, you know, a shot key, like 0 0.3 volts or something, which is better because you just get uh, a slightly higher level. Uh, but nevertheless, I was measuring around, and what was confusing the heck out of me is every time I plug this back in, yeah, measure between, on volts DC, measure between ground here, yeah, or ground on the chip, bottom left corner there, and it's a VCC pin up here. And I was getting like 1.2 volts or 1.3 volts, etc. But declining, going down, 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 down. And what's, what's throwing all the current? So I would put it on ohms and measure between ground and here. And it's like mega ohms, 7 mega ohms. So I'm like, how, how is the battery level going so low? And it's driven me to despair. All it is, put a screwdriver in that pot, I twist it, measure the voltage again. And it's normal, I'll show you. I, what I was figuring is that maybe it wasn't oscillating. So, like, instead of it doing some sort of efficiency thing where it's, you know, it's getting oscillation, it was, like, stuck in, a, like, a really high drain state where it's just not doing anything. And I think that's what it was. So I'm going to get some deoxy in there and clean that in a minute. We, we probably did that in the repair. I honestly do not remember with this one. I'd need to look back at the video. But if I just uh, wedge this in, uh, hang on, if I can align it... There we go, it's easier said than done. Press it in. And now measure from the ground down here. Yeah, and you can just about see the meter there. So measure from the ground to its VCC pin. Oh look, it's doing it again. It's doing it again. It's going down, look. What is the issue here? I don't get it. I seriously don't get this. Let's just uh, move that pot. Oh, I've lost my screwdriver there. Right, let's just move that part one way, and then the other way, and then measure the voltage. Is it that part? Maybe it's me getting a bad ground. I don't know what's going on here. This is the thing that's confusing the heck out of me. It's going up now. But you see, it's easy to go, oh, well, it must be the pin on there, you got a bad connection. But then I measure on here, and this voltage would plummet as if someone's, like, sucking the power out of it. I mean, that's going up. The reason it's going up, you can see it bobbing around all over the place there, is because this cap has to charge up. You get inrush initially from this power being powered, and that cap uh, just needs to charge up. I think that's what's uh, going on there. Because you do get to a stable... Volts. You can see like 2.5s climbing. So I don't know. I think I've resolved it. I'm going to get some deoxy into that. Let's uh, just pull the battery off. It's got to be that. It can't be anything else really, can it? Unless the chip is just faulty. Um, but I've checked everything around here. I, I, I don't. Uh, I can't see any other calls for this. And obviously I'll clean this out with some IPA and toothbrush uh, in a bit so it's getting the pot in there going left right left right left right left right left right left right doesn't matter if it's not exactly positioned I mean what you can do is we might do it in a minute scope that clock and then um, I'm just gonna go around a few times actually in different directions yeah scope that clock and then adjust it it's just like a fine adjust for the Presumably the 32.768 kilohertz. So let's just uh, let's just try and absorb what we can with a cotton bud there, and we'll just uh, get a bit of IPA into that. It's going to sort of like leak through, get rid of the deoxy, and then we just need to mop up around it, I guess. What we can do is just 
squish this like that, pull it out a bit, squish it at the end a bit, and just try and get a bit more of an extended absorbance. And And give it a blow for good measure. Right, that's that. I do need to clean around there again in a bit because I've been messing around so much around there. Anyway, let's uh, let's just get the battery back on again. See what happens this time. It just seems really flaky. Makes me wonder if it's a virus or something around here that's causing a strange behaviour. Maybe. I don't know. Right, I'm going to solder it back in and just see what happens. Right, so setting date and time here now. So it's the 30th of January. I'll do. Save and exit. So, yeah, it's progressing with the seconds. That's a clue as well. Look. It seems to be working with regards to the 32.768 kilohertz clock. Um, I can tell you what, let's just switch it off. Leave it a few seconds and then I'll. Power it back on. You really need to leave it a while, actually, really, because that capacitor on its own, if the battery is not in circuit, will uh, hold power for a minute or two, a few minutes maybe, maybe even longer than a few minutes. Um, yeah, it takes a while on Kickstart 3 here to boot for floppy, but there we go, it's boot new. Let's see if it's kept that at all. Yes, it has. And it seems to have progressed. So, obviously, the real test is overnight. But I'm going to have to uh, check this a number of times before I send this back because I'm a wee bit paranoid about how uh, stable the, the voltage uh, is there on that. You know, is it going to start dropping again instantly like it did before, just with a, I don't know, a knock or a wobble? So the battery showing 2.8. The real time clock chip is showing, there you go, 4.83. So it's been powered by the 5 volt rail at this point, and we've got the diode coming out of this, I'll show you where I put that on the underside, it's the same as where I've done, on these, I've done it on these before, uh, and then the two little 1N4148s here, yeah we've got 5.39 there, and 5.3 there, I, I'm sure that's supposed to be the 12 volt rail, it goes via a 478, uh, uh, 470 ohm resistor though, so I don't know, let me just measure the 12 volt rail on this. Uh, it's not the 12 volt rail, it comes from the 5 volt rail. I'm really confused. Yeah, so that is correct. The schematics show 12 volts going in, but that isn't how it's wired. It's via a 470 ohm resistor from the 5 volt rail. So, I don't know. It's strange, isn't it, how Commodore sometimes have these things on the schematics and then it ends up being totally different in, uh, in reality. Anyway, that's working. So just testing out his system with Diagram here, everything's running fine. I've pretty much finished cleaning up, uh, you know, tin and pads and things. There's lots of videos, there'll be a few links uh, top right here covering that sort of thing, you know, using braid with some flux and some solder and tin up traces. Yeah, so I've tinned up pretty much every single bit of copper and corroded pad that I could see. And it's working perfectly. The reliability of the real-time clock is perfect. So other than a quick scrub on the top side around any bits of dust and dirt, and the, the board is a bit dusty, um, yeah, I just need to turn my attention to the underside now. I'll uh, tidy up that wire mod from where Kath has had to replace the joystick port and uh, maybe turn up at the odd pad that's around there that may need turning. I don't know, it looks a bit like unleaded solder to me. Joined This one here is joined to one of the pins here, I think, and to that component there, that EMI component, I think it is. Uh, and then from one of the pins here again to a capacitor or something there. So, yeah, I'm just going to just uh, heat and remove these. Let's just uh, have a look. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's going to that ferrite there. Let's just heat the point of that ferrite. Might even be able to see where the trace is damaged. Yeah, I've got some flux onto that. That is definitely unleaded solder. It's got that horrible matte grey appearance uh, to it. And let's just pull it off. So it's the end pin here. Um, yeah, so the pad's not there, is it? That's the issue with that. Yeah, so let's just get a wee bit of uh, flux uh, here on that ferrite. Hang on, is it that ferrite? Oh, it's there. Yeah, it goes quite a long way over. 
Yeah, I stuck the flux in the wrong place, let's stick a bit over there. So we'll get a, a piece of kind of wrap it around that pin joint onto that set for right. The other thing here, just looking at this, it looks like we've got uh, almost a break here on this uh, pad and trace. Let's just to see if we can uh, see what that looks like actually. Let's just remove that off. Uh. Yeah, it's actually okay. There is a pad there for that connection. So we'll just add some fresh solder onto that one. That's that one done. Um, I think while we're here, actually, we'll, we'll just do the other ones on this port. Because, yeah, there's a plug there, look. Uh, yeah, because of that awful solder. And then squeeze together. So we've basically got a little loop, as you can see. But it's just going to add a little bit of strength. Otherwise your soldering gets side onto a pin with a tiny piece of wire and you get the smallest little bit of solder holding it on. If you get a little loop like that, it's uh, you know it's like the wire is kind of joined to its own little pad. Sorry I couldn't show you that, but yeah, I got like a, an elongated uh, loop two or three times around there and the wire's coming out from the top side and we can just sort of root it over here. I uh, just need to just cut it to length, you know, give myself a little bit of slack here and then solder it onto that far right. Right, that's both of those done. I just need to clean up now. Anyway, that is looking a lot better, I think. So, Cather's A3000 is coming up as well. Um, yeah, not without uh, some uh, issues. But Cather's also gave me these things here, a Harlequin 128 issue 2D. So this is the 128k version. I'm absolutely blown away. Oh, I need to eat these, don't they? Have these gone off already or not? No, they're not. Oh, they have. Yeah. 23rd of the 1st, 23. Yeah. I always get these from Bike Delight. They've always gone off by the time I get them. It's so annoying. If you're watching Bike Delight, please send me some of these. I want to see what they taste like. Um, yeah, so Chris has kindly, like I say, included this full kit here. It's got all the chips and everything. I think there's a PCB, yeah, taped to the top there. That is just absolutely amazing. So that'll be a short video. I won't make it quite as long as the original Harlequin build, but nevertheless, we will build that. I may see if I can get a keyboard and case and stuff to go with that. Uh, watch this space. And recently, this, this is uh, super. It really is super. I love it. It's a chip leg straightener. So you've got profile here for the small narrow dip, yeah, and then one for the wide. Forget the exact measurements, but yeah, I've been using this, as you'll see, on the Amiga 3000 repair. And if you remember the original series, he included some chip quick flux. This time round, he's included some chip quick 6040 solder. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic, so very much appreciated. And you know what? He's gone above and beyond because when I fixed the 3000, you know, as I said at the beginning of this video, I didn't want anything for this, for the 4000 repair, because I felt like it's a warranty thing, even though it's a few years later. Um, but then I've not had to cover the shipping because he wanted to pay for the shipping on the 3000 going back to him. Um, but he's, you know, he's, not only has he thrown this stuff in, but he paid me for the, the, the repair to the 3000 as well. I mean, granted, I did spend a crazy amount of hours, like over 100 hours easily. It's insane how much time I spent on the 3000. The 4000 wasn't too bad, it was about a week of work, maybe mm, 15 hours, something like that, maybe 20 hours, I don't know, because I'm pretty thorough when I do all the cleanup work and stuff, you know, you know, you'll know that by now. I'm sure nobody's obsessively compulsive at cleaning as I am when it comes to these things. But anyway, much appreciated, Cathers, can't thank you enough. Right, that's it, pretty much hold on. I'm just gonna have a clean up with some cotton buds, I won't show you that. I'll just give you a quick look over the board. I told you it was going to be a short one this time, it makes a change. So a quick look over the board, it's uh, just had a clean up, so yeah, you can see lots of wires have been plugged around here, if you look at the uh, the ones down next to that white port there, there's a whole strip of them. Yeah, everything pretty much has been tinned up around there, all around the middle, we've got new jumpers, new jumper, new jumper, uh, real time clock is working. So yeah, it's as clean as it's going to get. It's not much cleaner than it was when I left it, but yeah, there were some wires and things that uh, you know just needed a bit of attention. Anyway, I do hope you found the video interesting. Please like, share, subscribe. I'll catch you in the next video.